Uh, thank you, Sydney, for that kind introduction. As she said, the topic of today's webinar is the fundamentals of laser protective eyewear. So here's some of the topics that we will discuss today. Uh, and with that, let's get right to it. Uh, what is really the role of laser protective eyewear outside of making you look cool? Uh, laser eyewear uh, is probably the term most associated with the term laser safety. When you think laser safety, laser eyewear seems to jump right to the front of the line. Uh, the role of that eyewear is to reduce any beam that strikes the lens to a safe exposure level. That safe exposure level is what we term the maximum permissible exposure, or MPE. Uh, wavelength exposure up to and including the MPE value is safe. So the best way to think of MPE, at least in my mind, is think of it as the speed limit. Uh, if you're out on the road, the faster you speed, uh, the more likely you are to get a ticket or, an accident, or be in an accident. Uh, the higher one's exposure above the MPE, the greater potential for damage to your eyes or your skin. The official definition of MPE, the level of laser radiation to which an unprotected person may be exposed without adverse biological changes in the eye or the skin. So where do we find these values? Uh, the ANSI Z136 standard, Safe Use of Lasers, is the official home of MPE values. Uh, while other ANSI standards may have a sampling of MPE values, the most current values based on the latest data is what you find in Z136.1. Uh, MPE values can also be found in the European standard 60825-14, which is the laser user's guide. MPE values are not some abstract mathematical number, they actually come from biological testing and data uh, over, over time. And it's also done on the, on the premise that your eye is open to a seven millimeter uh, a pupil diameter, which is slightly smaller than full dilation. So it's being very conservative. Uh, I think it'd be very much a disservice to laser safety and any laser user if I did not point out that the best protection is to remove yourself from from risk. So in that case, beam enclosure or remote viewing is far superior to any type of eyewear you may wear. So several factors go into selecting the best eyewear for your application. Uh, on the lens side of the equation, there's what wavelength coverage you need to provide protection for. What's the optical density or the attenuation? Uh, how well can you see visible light transmission? Uh, related to how well is visual acuity, clarity? Uh, impact resistance, is that an issue for you? Weight, uh, how heavy is the frame on your face? Uh, on the frame side of the equation, there are things such as fit, uh, peripheral vision, and labeling. Of those uh, uh, three, peripheral vision is probably the least important. Uh, filter choice. Uh, so you need to, not all filters are the same, it's not one size fits all. So you need to determine what's the best filter for the wavelength and the laser that you're using. So from the laser specifications, output, pulse duration, things of that nature, you can calculate the optical density that is required or the scale number, L. So, and you also need to consider visibility. Uh, the more wavelength you're trying to cover, usually the greater challenge there is to find the right filter. Uh, now, some wavelengths, such as 10.6 micron to carbon dioxide laser and UV 1090 to 350 nanometers, it's rather easy to find a good pair of eyewear with great visibility and protection for those uh, wavelengths. Then there's always a question of, do I want a glass filter or a plastic filter? Uh, there are major differences between the two. Uh, first is weight. A uh, glass lens will always be heavier on your face. And the question gets to be, uh, is that gonna be comfortable for a full day? Uh, second is visibility. Uh, as a rule of thumb, using glass filters will give you a greater level of visibility. Uh, then there's cost. Plastic will always be less expensive than a glass filter. And then there's care. Uh, while, you know, I were always needed to be treated with respect, uh, plastic lenses will just tolerate more abuse 
than a glass lens uh, will. This is primarily because most glass lenses have some type of coating put on them and you don't want to damage that coating. Optical density, it's an attenuation. Uh, the goal of laser eye, of course, is that any laser radiation that strikes the lens portion of your eyewear will be blocked or reduced so that anything that's transmitted through will be at or below the NPE value. Uh, and this uh, attenuation can be achieved by uh, the filter absorbing uh, the photons or reflecting them off to somebody else. Uh, optical density, log ratio of the incident beam versus what's transmitted. So here's some examples, an OD of one, a tenth of the wave of, of the output is transmitted, OD2, a hundredth, OD3, a thousandth, and it goes on uh, from there. Optical density has no units. Uh, scale number is sort of how the European standard represents uh, what you would think of as optical density, and we will talk more about that. So all I can say is stay tuned. Uh, visible beams. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Uh, visible laser beams below about 100 milliwatts, they're a real challenge because almost every, op almost every pair of eyewear, no matter what the optical density, will pretty much make, make it go away so you can't see anything, which goes back to the issue of uh, alignment. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. Visual light transmittance or visible light transmittance uh, basically is how well can I see with my eyewear on? Uh, how much visible light gets through? Uh, the problem with uh, uh, eyewear filters is that some will have a VLT as low as 1% and others will be as high as 95% or higher. Uh, general feeling is in a well-lit room, you need a VLT of at least 20% for decent vision. Uh, therefore, being aware of what the lighting conditions are in your work area is extremely important. And if I'm working in a brightly lit room, or is it low lighting, or is there no lighting because I'm concerned about uh, photon uh, pollution on my sample or my detector? Uh, if room lighting, uh, yeah, 30 percent is really a good number. And if I had to reduce it, uh, have really low lighting, maybe task lighting will, will help me. So visibility in plastic lenses. Uh, so most plastic lenses, there's an absorptive dye that absorbs the photons of the wavelength of concern. Uh, the higher the optical density you want, the greater concentration of dye is required. The more dye that's there, the darker it gets. So there's a, a tint. Visual acuity is something that people have just started recently talking about. And it's sort of saying, okay, based on the the, the tint of the filter and the colors that you, you have to see, how well can you see? And so visual acuity sometimes is not the same as VLT, and you can have a low VLT and still have good visual acuity. An example of this is the uh, eyewear that's sold for nighttime dr driving, which has a yellow tint. Uh, the actual VLT of that eyewear is pretty low because of the visible wavelengths it blocks out but it does give you good visibility uh, when you're uh, uh, driving. So traditional laser eyewear is either an absorptive type of filter or reflective technology. If it's absorptive, it's either dye-based or glass. So once again, on, on plastic, absorbing material or acrylic, uh, basically uh, darker the, 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 uh, the filter usually means the more dye concentration that is, that is there. Uh, eyewear manufacturers are constantly looking for dyes that will give you a high level of protection and give you good visibility. So it's ever changing and things have been getting better and better over the years. Uh, so the glass technology, these are really designed for the infrared portion of the spectrum. Uh, they usually give you much better visibility than plastic lenses. Uh, downsizes their weight. There is some limitations to shape so you can get an even coating across the, the whole frame. This is why sometimes you'll find a filter, but it's only available in one or two frame styles. Uh, glass eyewear uh, has a minimum impact resistance. When laser eyewear first came out, 
we're using type of, of shot glass and it is not doesn't have not a high level of impact resistance so the dilemma was did we want eye protection or did we want impact resistance so this is why laser eye was officially exempt from the impact resistance standards also the fact is that if you have a dielectric coating of some sort on your glass eyewear, it can be scratched off. Where it's scratched off, you have no protection. Reflective technology is an interesting choice. They usually give you good VLT, they're lighter weight, and the goal is that uh, the wavelength you're concerned about gets reflected off and all other wavelengths would get transmitted through primarily the visible ones. Uh, disadvantages or problems, there's an angle sensitivity, once again, limited shapes. Uh, question, can I reflect off enough laser radiation to hurt somebody else? The answer is yes. Uh, depending on the uh, output of the beam, you certainly is a possibility. Uh, usually they only offer a narrow uh, bandwidth for protection. And once again, I said you, they're usually a dielectric coating. Uh, some damage to dielectric coatings is even on a microscopic lev level, and it's not obvious. Other times it's, it's quite clear. On the frame side of the equation, uh, fit. I think fit to me is the most important factor on a frame. Uh, you know, if it doesn't fit, you're not going to wear it. Uh, if, it and if it doesn't fit properly, if it slips down, if you feel there are big gaps, uh, it's got to fit properly. Uh, and this is a problem for people. But today, there are so many styles of laser eyewear that anyone should be able to find a pair that fits their facial features. And here's an example. Uh, you have one pair here that's got a ratcheting up and down the, the temples. The other one's got little clips that helps it uh, hold on to the back of your ear. There's uh, bayonet slide temples. There's straps. Uh, there's a lot out there, so you should be able to find a pair that uh, will fit you and stay comfortable on your face. Uh, Wraparound frames. Uh, you know, these can be worn by anyone, but they're favored by a lot of people that have glasses, and this fits over their, their glass frame. And uh, like I said, there are different options. And if you have a pair like this and you still feel it slipping, a suggestion I get is you get straps to hold it up to the back of your head. Uh, goggle style uh, eyewear, uh, it's out there. Uh, it fits over most glasses. They always say they're all anti-fog. They've got like a silicon seal, so it's like wearing a scuba mask. Some people find them very comfortable. Others uh, find that they cannot wear them for any great length of time. Uh, this, on this slide, there's two pictures of laser eyewear, sort of some of the original type of eyewear designs that were out there. They're uncomfortable. They're heavy. You got no peripheral vision. They look terrible, and yet I still find these in people's laser labs, and I... I can't figure out why, but, you know, they've got them. Labeling. From the perspective of laser eyewear, particularly in a regulatory concern, uh, labeling gets a lot of attention. And labeling is actually a hazard communication device. So, you know, you have eyewear, it's got to be labeled properly, and we'll talk a lot a bit uh, about this. Most findings in laser labs, from an audit perspective, when it deals with eyewear, all falls back on labeling. Uh, the eyewear standard Z136.1 sets the labeling requirements and items to be considered in selecting eyewear, and this is pretty much repeated in all the laser ANSI standards. Uh, Z136.7 is the eyewear standard that gives you protocols for testing laser eyewear and has a wealth of information about eyewear. Uh, in the rest of the world, there's EN207, EN208, each one we'll touch on. And this gives out the uh, eyewear requirements, which are basically repeated in 60825-14, the user guide. So the United States laser eyewear must be labeled with the wavelength it provides protection for, as well as what its attenuation is, OD. And if the labeling wears off, the eyewear is illegal to use. doesn't matter if you have eight other pairs of the same thing. Uh, any pair where the labeling is worn off, that pair is illegal to be used. And if it's found mixed in among your other eyewear, you're going to get cited on that. Uh, labeling font and location is all at the discretion of the manufacturer. Uh, now, if my labeling wears off, can I relabel it as the user? 
without a doubt. Uh, you certainly can do that. Uh, some people put unique identifiers on their eyewear, which we'll talk about. And the only other labeling you sometimes find on eyewear is the percentage of VLT. So here's two pairs of eyewear with labeling on it. Uh, you can see on one, there's actually labeling on both on both lenses. Uh, one side's got the U.S. labeling, the other side's got the European labeling. Uh, and the other one's got all the labeling, both types in 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 the, in the center. So step aside for a second. There's a question of my eyewear says greater than or plus. What does that mean to me? Is it mean my eyewear, the optical density just keeps rising up? Not the case. So if you look at the example here, we have a pair of eyewear that's labeled uh, 680 to 780 nanometers OD greater than 6. So what does that really mean to me? Well, it means between 680 and 780 nanometers, the optical density will never drop below an OD of 6. For some of those wavelengths, it may be considerably higher and then drops down, but it will never fall below the optical density of 6. That's what greater than or plus means. It's giving you what's the level of eye protection. Uh, labeling missing. Okay. A uh, small spec segment of users sometimes use eyewear for wavelengths that are not listed on them. So maybe the eyewear says it goes up to uh, uh, 780, and their wavelength that they're using is 790. Well, you know, it's 10 nanometers off, things pretty close. Uh, unless you've got curves or documentation from the manufacturer to show you that you're getting protection at that 790 and what the level is, you cannot be guaranteed that you're getting adequate protection. The legal liability of the eyewear manufacturer just extends to what is labeled on the eyewear. Uh, charts on their website and stuff, that does not, you cannot base your use on that. You need to check with the manufacturer. Their liability is just what's labeled on the eyewear. Uh, now, uh, ANSIP compliant facilities, uh, you have to label your eyewear. Well, I'm a little bit mumbling on this, but the next slide should show. So what we have here is a poster where basically this is where the eyewear is stored. It shows you what the eyewear looks like. It has all the optical density and wavelength. And it also has a unique identifier. So you can see like I4, I5. Uh, so this is a case where even if the labeling wears off and the unique identifier is still on it, you can go to the poster like this and say, oh, this is pair I4, and here's the information for me. So this kind of takes care of the issue of if your labeling wears off. That never hurts to be original. So and you've got a, a one chart that says current laser status that tells you which laser's in use, indicating what eyewear you should wear. The other one with our friend Smokey the Bear uh, shows you the eyewear, but also tells you what wavelength uh, is being used, so therefore what eyewear you should be wearing. Uh, the pair in the center has got a plastic heat shrink uh, wrap on it, which can be used to identify which eyewear goes for uh, which, which, which wavelengths. European labeling. Uh, without a doubt, European labeling is more descriptive, more informative than the U.S. system. The difference is the U.S. system does not require interpretation while the European system, it really is based on a code, and you have to know what that code means. And it's not intuitive. It reminds me a lot of vehicle identification number, which is a mixture of letters and numbers. If you know what the code is, you have a wealth of information. If you don't, it's gibberish. Uh, in addition, uh, no eyewear can be sold in Europe without a CE mark on it. There are two European norms on eyewear, EN207 and EN208. And like I said, we're going to touch on each of them in a few slides. So here's a pair of eyewear. It's got labeling on both sides. Uh, one is the U.S., one is the European. And you, and you look on the U.S. side. One says uh, 980 to 1064 OD7+, plus, 850 to 980 nanometers OD5+. Plus. That's pretty straightforward of what wavelength it covers and what the optical density is. Look on the European side and you see things like 532DL5 plus IRML6. Uh, 
you know, 780 to 850 DIRL4, it just goes on. Uh, unless you know what the code is, that is really pretty, less, pretty much meaningless. So V stands for continuous wave, I is for uh, normal pulse of, you know, microseconds, uh, R, Q switch, uh, microseconds up to nanoseconds, and mode lock is anything faster than a nanosecond. And you find this information in EN207, personal eye protection, filters and eye protectors against laser radiation. So basically it's eyewear sample. This is for full protection laser eyewear. A little bit about frame integrity, which is also in the European standards. Uh, the frame of your eyewear must be able to hold up, the frame and the length hold up for a five second exposure through continuous wave laser and 50 pulses uh, for a pulse laser. Uh, you know, regardless of what anyone says, laser eyewear is not made for you to stare down the laser beam. I would not say, gee, I can look at this laser directly for three seconds because I have two, uh, two more. Uh, you know, you're being foolish. Uh, basically, laser eyewear is really designed for you to be looking at uh, diffuse uh, reflections. So protective number and the European standard uh, L number, which now is LB. Uh, so basically, the idea is that uh, the LB number is the most limiting of either the optical density or the ability of the filter to withstand incident exposure without damage. So you have to take into both considerations. So an example is I may have a filter which uh, exposed to a source uh, reduces the, ex the incident exposure by a factor of 1,000. So that's an OD of 3. But when struck with the actual laser, the filter itself uh, will not take an exposure higher than an optical density or higher than uh, 100 times the MPE. The irradiance of the beam is too high. It's going to damage the, uh, the lens. So therefore, it will be labeled with a LB2. So is my eyewear L or my eyewear LB? What's the difference? Uh, the original EN207, it was L scale number. When the next edition of EN207 came out, to indicate there was a, it was a newer edition, L became LB. Uh, when the next edition of EN207 comes out, you'll switch to LC. Uh, so, you know, it, it's trying to tell you that this eyewear is based on the latest MPE values, but once again, you need to know what's the most recent edition. It should be, should my eyewear be L, it should be LB, should be LC. You have to find out. EN208, personal eye protection. Eye protectors for adjustment work on lasers and laser systems. What they mean by adjustment work is laser alignment. Uh, it is the only standard dedicated to alignment completely and it's visible wavelengths, 400 to 700 uh, nanometers. And the scale number used for alignment eyewear is R rather than L. And there are recommendations for optical density for different outputs, as you can see here on the, on the slide. Uh, a little bit about laser eyewear and audits. Uh, the most common findings on laser audits are usually centers on eyewear. Uh, and a lot of this deals with the fact that most laser auditors may not have a full understanding of the technology you're doing or your laser system, but they certainly can look at a pair of eyewear and tell you whether it's labeled or not. So that's where they tend to focus. So has the labeling worn off? Is the labeling unreadable? Uh, eyewear used for wavelengths not listed on them. It goes back to the getting documentation of what uh, from the manufacturer. A wrong eyewear mixed with user's eyewear. We'll be, give you an example of that a little bit later on. Is the frame damaged? Is the filter damaged? Have scratches? Have burn marks? Uh, no eyewear can be found for the wavelengths in use. Uh, using shop glasses uh, for UV and carbon dioxide wavelengths. Uh, you find this a lot in medical facilities where they know that polycarbonate absorbs a CO2 and UV and they don't want to buy certified laser eyewear so they get safety glasses. Uh, if I'm dealing with ultraviolet, uh, 
I'm probably more concerned about not just my eyes, but also skin exposure, skin cancer. So in a case like that, if there's a lot of scatter, I'm wearing a full face shield may, will provide me a greater protection. Impact resistance, as I said, it is not a requirement in the standard. So if you, if you feel that's an issue that's important to you, uh, you need to have eyewear that states on it that is impact resistant. So in the United States, that would be the Z87 uh, standard. Uh, not required, uh, and you cannot assume that all plastic eyewear is Z87 uh, compliant. So it's not labeled, it's not compliant uh, with that. Uh, if you uh, can find a pair, problem solved. If you can't, you can uh, try to put safety glasses over your eyewear, which generally is pretty foolish. Or if it's a glass lens, you can have it hardened uh, to meet the standard, but that's also very expensive. So once again, uh, you know, the question is, how important is impact resistant to what you're doing? Uh, I would have focus on beam enclosure and eyewear uh, more than worrying about impact resistant. Uh, the people that are most concerned about this is the military and their concern about ballistic levels. The better you take care of your eyewear, the better it's going to take care of you. So how well you store it is very important. There are commercial bins of many varieties that are available, and the eyewear holder on the tan door here basically is a shoe tree. Uh, but they're pretty inexpensive and they work very well. Uh, the only advice I can give you is you want one that's uh, all plastic. If it has like a cloth background on it, uh, you can get fibers can get into the air from them and then those fibers can find their way to your optics. This is not the way to store your laser eyewear. Uh, one is I got a cardboard box with probably thousand dollars or more of laser eyewear in them and you can just see that Potential for getting scratched or being damaged is just greater. And the other slide, I've got uh, eyewear with an elastic strap. You hang it like this. Uh, gravity has an effect on it, and over time, this eyewear will be uh, unusable. No matter how good your eyewear is, you actually have to wear it. Uh, just being in the lab does not give you protection. So uh, it has to be worn. You don't want to have your faces like in two of these slides. Over, over, the, over the beam path and with no protection. Uh, and in our last picture here, we have one pair, one person wearing their eye protection and the other person protecting their forehead. Uh, this is just terrible mentoring. If eyewear is required, it should be worn. Eyewear is not impregnable. Uh, with the higher radiance of laser beams available today, uh, uh, a direct tick to your eyewear uh, can burn through or damage your eyewear considerably. Uh, you know, eyewear, like I said, is not made for you to stare down lasers. If I'm wearing plastic eyewear and I get hit directly with the beam, uh, you know, there are usually some indicators that you're in the wrong spot. It can be smoke, it can be a melting pattern, it can be uh, sparks, or your eyewear can burst into flames, which is a pretty good indicator you're in the wrong spot. So here's some photos of some eyewear that have been damaged due to different laser exposures. Uh, I'll let you read this, but the one that's most interesting to me is pair D, which is over time, it has gotten darker, so we call this bleaching. While the optical density has not changed, the visible light transmittance has been gotten worse and worse. So this is a pair that's really unusable. But once again, it's due to exposure from UV over over a period of time, usually years. Ultra-fast lasers. This is a real challenge in our world today. Uh, about 20 years ago, Brooks Air Force Base uh, did testing on glass and plastic eyewear, and what it found that there was a non-uniform non bleaching effect. Uh, and this related to the relaxation time of uh, the dyes, result of dyes. So photon comes in, uh, the dye molecule absorbs it, it goes to an excited state, it cannot take on another photon until it drops back to the ground state. Well, pico femtosecond laser pulses, so many photons are coming through, and so quickly the absorptive dyes cannot stop them all. So there's a definite effect on, 
on the optical density that the IRA claims to provide you. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST out in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, about three years ago, uh, repeated this work and they confirmed that Brooks's results are still accurate. Uh, so this is primarily picoseconds, femcoseconds. Uh, attosecond systems are coming more common, but all the experience I've had with attosecond systems, uh, the pulses are all generated inside a vacuum, so it's not an issue. Uh, and you just need to be careful. So here's an example where putting more emphasis on beam enclosure is better than uh, eyewear or just being aware of it. Uh, M-rated labeling was designated for filters that are supposed to stop ultra-fast laser pulses. Uh, they are out there. They can be effective. Uh, they usually offer a narrower range of coverage than uh, non-M-rated eyewear. Oh, Lyman eyewear. Okay, finally. Uh, this is only for visible beams, and it's here to address the question, how can I align my system if I can't see the beam? I, uh, why, I can't wear, see with my eyewear on. So alignment eyewear is designed to have an optical density less than what would give you full protection. So the idea is you're going to see the beam a little fainter, but you will have visibility. So the concept is if the beam were to hit your lens, what passes through will be bright enough for you to indicate that you're being struck, so your diversion response would make you turn away, but not strong enough for instant damage. Uh, ANSI Z136.1 and ANSI Z136.8, which is the research standard, uh, provide uh, considerable guidance on how to select the Lyman eyewear. And uh, Z136 is the only one that has recommendations on pulse systems. Uh, for UV and for infrared systems, you should not be wearing alignment eyewear. So here's an example of a chart uh, and talking about just uh, using your eyewear for the wavelengths that are labeled on it. As you can see, uh, so the bluish uh, line, the fainter one, is the optical density. You can be a couple of nanometers off from that curve and your OD you're going to get, depending on which side of the curve you're on, it can be considerably different. So if you really have an issue where you're using a wavelength that's not labeled on your eyewear and you feel it's got protection and the manufacturer confirms that, ask the manufacturer to relabel your eyewear. Now, inspecting your eyewear, never a bad idea to check your safety equipment to make sure it's okay before you use it. So you want to verify the eyewear is appropriate for the output of the laser you're using, that uh, you have enough eyewear on hand for whoever may come in. Uh, you know, is it dirty? Is it clean? Are the temples broken? Uh, looking for scratches, uh, burn marks. Uh, if you have burn marks on your eyewear, eh, that indicates there's a problem. Uh, you know, make sure the reliability of the filters, uh, all these type of things. Uh, how well it fits, anything of that nature. Take a good look at it, make sure it's labeling, you can read the labeling, pays to examine it. So here's a couple of slides of pictures of you know, terrible eyewear, uh, bleaching, we talked about uh, the UV effect, uh, scratches, frame damage, or stretched out straps, labeling worn off, you can't read the labeling. People get old like me, reading is harder and harder. That's why I like the posters of uh, burn marks. Uh, crazing is sort of almost sort of a chemical reaction on the coating. So here's an example back in January of 2016. Uh, people working with 800 nanometer beam, they're about to align it. Uh, they had a nonlinear crystal, so they had doubling of the 800 to 400 nanometers. But the eyewear the gentleman was wearing was only geared for 800 nanometers. So he's doing some work with a vertical beam. He gets a reflection. And just what happens, the 400 nanometer goes right through his eyewear because the eyewear is not made to stop it. Uh, once again, you got to know what wavelengths you're dealing with and what type of eyewear you need. All right, this is a really interesting case here. Uh, the fellow comes into the room. The room is, is dark because of experimental requirements. Uh, he knows where the eyewear is being stored, right, right near the entrance. He reaches down, picks up a pair of eyewear, puts it on, goes, you know, keeps 
goes into the lab closer to the uh, laser source. He sort of notices a sort of a green light for a second or so, doesn't think much about it. He's at the workstation, his computer terminal, and he he knows from experience that uh, when he's wearing the, the right eyewear, the screen has sort of an orange tint to it due to the eyewear. But now it looks gray. So he's smart enough to say, maybe something's not right here. So he leaves the room, and what he finds out is that when he reached down to pick up the eyewear in the darkened room, he picked up a pair of sunglasses that somebody had left there when they took them off to, to put on the proper eyewear. All right, uh, cannot escape the pandemic. Uh, most laser eyewear is adversely impacted by disinfectant. So how do we disinfect, how do we clean our, our eyewear? We want to make sure, particularly if we're in a working environment where people are sharing eyewear or any pair can be used by anyone else, that they're, they're clean and they're, and, and, and they're safe. Uh, all the eyewear manufacturers have been besieged by questions like this. Uh, you can always ask them and say, you know, what do you recommend for this pair of eyewear, this filter? Uh, some people have tried using bleach. Uh, bleach is not good for your frames. Uh, so basically you can, it will start to harden the frame, make it more brittle. Uh, it can make it very sticky. Uh, bleach is not the answer. From talking with various experts around the world, the consensus seems to be that mild soap and water is the best way to clean your laser eyewear. Uh, you want to make sure the soap is free of any type of abrasives, microbeads, grit, or something like that. You don't want to be scratching uh, the filter. Uh, your hands got to be clean, you know, 20 seconds of washing, a small amount of soap. Uh, you can rinse the eyewear, put the soap on your fingertips and go do it that way. Or better yet is to use some type of uh, cloth, uh, soft lint-free cloth is what you want uh, to use it. There are different techniques. People like to uh, advocate for cleaning with the cloth. Uh, the cloths themselves uh, should be kept in a Ziploc bag and you want to keep them clean. And probably about once a week, you probably should clean those cloths or uh, dispose of them and use something, a new one. Uh, you don't want dirt and dust to get on the cloths. Why they say they should be in a Ziploc bag. Uh, if you've got coating, dielectric coatings on your eye, where you definitely want to check with the manufacturer to make sure what you're doing is fine because you damage it, you're not going to get a replacement uh, like a warrant. What about using UV devices? I've seen a lot of these advertised in different settings. A uh, common opinion is that that's not the way to, to disinfect your eyewear. A lot has to do with how long you keep it exposed, trying to reach all surfaces on the eyewear, with the intensity of the beam it produces, what wavelength range you're using. General consensus, I said, is that these devices are not uh, appropriate for uh, laser eyewear. Uh, laser safety, you know, is not just laser eyewear. There are films you can get. There's acrylic uh, panels, uh, which all the stacks like big sheets of laser eyewear. Uh, you want to stop stray reflections. There's curtains, there's beam blocks, shutters, sensor cards, viewers, interlocks, a whole slew of products that are out there that will help you with that. Uh, there are screens you can get, uh, films you can put on enclosures or windows that will give you protection. And with that, we've run a little bit long, but I want to say it is time for questions. Uh, if we don't get to your questions today, uh, you can be sure you'll get an email from me uh, addressing them. And with that, I will turn everything over to uh, uh, Cindy. Okay.